My name is Eduardo Silva. Uh, I work for a company which is called Treasure Data, but now we are called ARM Treasure Data. We were acquired some time ago. And this, this presentation is mostly about logging uh, the problems that ex exist in general for cloud environment or distributed systems and the different approaches that exist to solve the problems. Okay, I work as a software engineer at this company and I'm a maintainer of this project which is called FluentBet. Maybe you are familiar with FluentD, which is a CNCF and Linux Foundation project. And FluentBet is like the small brother of it. Okay, so let's start talking about a little bit about applications and logging. I know that most of you are familiar with syslog, systemd, systemd mostly, but we need to get back a little bit to understand the problems. So basically when an application wants to log something, if you're doing logging it's because you want to do data analysis, basically. So the way to do data analysis is concentrate or aggregate your logs somewhere. So basically one application triggered a message to a log file or to a stream, standard output or standard error. Okay, that is a common pattern. And in the container space, we focus mostly on standard output and standard error. But in Docker, considering that Docker is like a, the main, as one of the main uh, containers engine, you, we know everybody knows that a container by itself doesn't exist. A container is just a set of rules with the kernel applied to a process. And when Docker runs, or any application is running, if this application triggers a message, that message will be trapped by the Docker engine. For example, on this case, a simple message that said, hey Berlin, will get some metadata on it, like the timestamp at what time it was created, and also the stream that data is coming from. And that is fine. Of course, uh, not everybody is happy with JSON messages, you know, process me uh, JSON messages or text messages is quite expensive in terms of computing. And then when you get this message in, the, in Docker engine, Docker engine said, I'm going to store this message, message somewhere in the file system for persistency. There are other workarounds where Docker, you can say, please use journal D or use a different backend. But the common way in Kubernetes is just to try the file system because it's at, uh, the fastest persistent way. Okay, and this gets stored in the bar lib docker containers, the hash of the container, slash something, that log, and blah, blah, blah. So each message is appended, right, to the same file. So, but there's one problem here. So from an operational perspective, if you want to do logging, you need to understand where the logs are located. Once they are located, you need to start parsing these log files that was created by the Docker engine. And then you need to start looking up for special key fields inside the JSON maps that Docker generated, and maybe append some metadata on it. We're going to split footer. So Docker runs inside, well, Kubernetes works on top of Docker, right? Docker is a main container engine is one thing. Kubernetes, on top of that, try to orchestrate, right, and do self-healing of whole containers and applications. So the goal here is just try to explain uh, how logging works on this scenario and the problems that we're going to get. So in Kubernetes, for example, you have your application and this application will run a container. But this container is grouped inside a concept of a pod and a pod can have multiple containers. So here you start realizing that one application can have one logging format or one kind of messages. A different application in a different container, a different thing. But both are grouped in the same pod. And in a node in Kubernetes can have many pods. A node can be a virtual machine or a bare metal machine instance. And if you have a cluster, so logging becomes more complex. So that simple log file that we had in the file system is replicated. So we have the same time of messages in different places. And at some point, if you want to do data analysis, as we said at the beginning, you need to try to correlate all this information together. And of course, doing SSH, SSH or running the journal CTL command will not help on this kind of scenario. So the logging context is really relevant here in Kubernetes mostly. Because if you have one log message, you know that this log message was generated for some container. But this container comes from a pod, and that pod has an ID, 
and also belong to a namespace. And also this namespace, sorry, this pod was running in a node. And maybe the whole namespace or this pod was appended with some labels, with some annotations. And all this information allows you to give some context. Because at the end, if you have a distributed application and you generate a labels, annotations, you would like to correlate all this information back. Because you don't want to look at a, uh, to say, Elastic or any kind of database, please show me all the logs that come from pod X from node B, right? Maybe your application has many replicas. Those many replicas were to different nodes, and maybe one of the nodes is failing, but not all of them. Or maybe you want to troubleshoot a specific stuff from a different node or a group of, because of namespaces. So how this works? Basically, in Kubernetes, you need to try to gather the whole context to solve login. That means container name, container ID, post name, namespace, and so on. But all of this information comes from different places. Okay? The, the file system contains what is relevant from the local position, like the pod name, the namespace, and container name. This information is, a, is appended as a metadata by the Docker engine. But from a cluster perspective, in the API server or the master in Kubernetes, we also have some extra information like the port ID, container ID, the node name, the labels, and annotations. So as you can see, one simple message that was generated by one simple application in a container has more information than we can imagine. So we need some kind of log processor that can understand how the data has been stored, can understand the format, and how to gather this information from different places. And basically, the, the big thing is not the log processor. I would say that the big thing is just try to correlate all your information back in a storage service like Elastic, InfluxDB, or Kafka, because your end is not log processing. Your end is data analysis. But to get from end to end, you need a log processor. And I understand that nobody's happy with log processors. Nobody likes it, right? They are not fancy. They are not dashboards and things like that. So it is pretty low level. And you know, everybody, it's, everything is about performance. People say, oh, my log processor is running slow. It's consuming too much memory, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, because we need to add filters. We need to connect to different places. But of course, the goal of this is just not to blame the log processor. Just try to see how we can make it better and better from a programming perspective and also from a design perspective. So with that said, I would like to introduce FluentBit. And FluentBit is a child project of which born in 2015, like three years ago. And it was, it's, this is quite fun because it was created originally for embedded Linux. So at Treasure Data, we created FluentD years ago. We made it open source. And FluentD is really good. but some, sometimes people complain about the, it needs like 40 megabytes of memory to run because it's a mix of Ruby with C. And also, it's not quite lightweight if you want to run it in an embedded Linux system. So you're not going to run it. That's, that's true. You're not going to waste that amount of memory and CPU. So where th people said, why we cannot create something lightweight and something different? Well, Flow Embed was started. But when we started Flow Embed for embedded Linux, the people from Embedded Linux started using it, but OK, it's fine. We have syslog, we have these tools. But people from the cloud space where FluentD was running, or people who use Logstash too, say, hey, why you don't add this feature to FluentBet? This is really great. It's written in C language. It's using like five, 500 kilobytes in memory, which is awesome. Of course, if you start processing like thousands of messages, your memory go up. But anyways, it's quite lightweight. And after that, just three years of work and adding filters and many features, we say that nowadays we have like 50,000 deployments a day. Just a stats from our own Docker Hub. And maybe in a few days, we're reaching 10 million since March. So which is a, it's a huge number. And I thought that was unexpected. Because when people started asking for full embed, a lightweight log processor, we said, OK, maybe we're going to hit like 10,000 downloads a month. But now it's, it's growing like crazy. So imagine that 
if somebody has a, a Kubernetes cluster and this cluster is spinning up a new, a new node, that node likely is running uh, or file bits or log stash or FluentD or FluentBit. So FluentBit is written in C language. It's tied to low memory and CPU footprint. It has a pluggable architecture. Pluggable architecture, I mean, because when you have a log processor, it's really important to understand that is the goal is not to replace syslog, it's not the goal to replace systemd or journaldd. As a log processor, your goal is to integrate different sources of information in one place. And to accomplish that, you need to be able to talk to TCP, UDP, read logs from the file system, talk to systemd API, and so on. And it has built-in security as TLS. Because at the end, when you're shipping your logs outside, you're talking to third-party services. Could be, for example, Stackdriver, could be Elasticsearch, and of course, everybody, nobody wants to use plain HTTP. You want to use HTTPS or TS. So in, from an internal perspective, Flow and Bait is pretty basic, and we try to make it very simple. If you start designing something that needs to scale for thousands and thousands of nodes and also to 200 cores on this machine, Maybe your design uh, will get a lot of problems, and it's, it's, I would say that personally, it's better to optimize when it's needed and not beforehand. So basically, the the design is like you have input plugins on one side where they care about how to collect the data, and I mean, for example, if you're going to read uh, log files, you need a plugin to read log files. Okay, if you're going to receive messages over TCP, you need an input plugin that listens for messages over TCP. So the data comes from the input, and then we have the filters. Because before to ship the logs to somewhere, you need to process that data. And it runs in a single event loop. Yeah, it's one process. We don't support multi-process here. And then, and then we ship out the logs to our output plugin. And what's the relationship with, between an input and an output? An input takes the data from somewhere, it transforms the data to the internal representation of FluentBit, and then the output plugin takes care to take that information and transform that information to the format that is required by the third-party service. For example, Elasticsearch has a very specific format in JSON, which has a header and then the body. And for example, InfluxDB is a totally different protocol. It works over HTTP, but it's different. So, in data processing, uh, one thing that's really important is how to deal with unstructured data versus structured data. Because, as I said, you want to do data analysis. But, for example, think about Apache Logs. Apache Logs, you know, that has like a timestamp, a host, a user, and status code, a method, and a lot of information. But you understand that because you are familiar with. But for a computer, that is just only straight bytes. For example, um, let me show you one example. I think I have, ooh, where's that file? Yeah, yeah, I know, thank you. That was my full samples. Oh, here it is. Okay, so, we understand that. If so, at some point of, you, of your life you have ever deal with web service, you know that it's an IP address, a timestamp, and so on. But for a computer, that is just bytes. So if you want to do data analysis, and you want to get, please give me the whole uh, access log for slash clearance, which status code is 200, 204, you have two ways. If you handle this as instructor data, it will be quite expensive because you are parsing every single byte here. But if you convert this to a structured representation, you're going to just query the information that you care about, which will be this position and this position. But to accomplish that, you need a log processor. Okay? And for that, you have, we have many different of backends to process the data. One of them is with the regular expressions. 
So you said, please, uh, for Apache log files, use a special regular expression, which will create some kind of structure. Or maybe you can say, oh, this information that is coming in is a JSON map. Or maybe it's an LTSV format. And of course, each message can has also its own timestamp, because the message was generated at some point. So an internal representation of the data is like this. The input plugin get the data from somewhere, but internally it needs to emit, emit this record in the internal representation. And the internal representation, considering that is, this is not JSON, it's like, but it's similar, it's like an array where you have the timestamp and the message in a map. But internally, we use message pack. Are you familiar with message pack? Some of you. Message pack is like a binary JSON made for serialization. Okay, so we always convert the data from doesn't matter which is the format to binary internal representation. So an input plugin can generate many records, but if you're going to flush this data to different places, sometimes you would like to group this data because you can have data coming from files, from TCP, UDP, and maybe you would like to add some kind of notion from the, where this data is coming from or group them by some name. For example, we use the concept of tags. So an input plugin can say, please to the host these records that I'm ingesting, uh, attach a tag which is called apache.bhost1. And for the records that I'm coming from syslog, just append a tag which is called syslog. And then what happens internally, we have a routing system which said, okay, for every plugin that is asking for something that is started with Apache, in the tag, just redirect the records to this place. For everything that is exactly matched with syslog, send it to the different output plugin. So you can take sometimes different kind of input source of data and flush into different places or to multiple places. So in the output plugins, most of them rely on network I.O. So they need to do a network connection to a host. And you know, if you, do a, you create a socket, you trigger a connect system call, sometimes in a normal way that will, will block your program. Okay? But if you're using a synchronous I.O., that will return back, but you need some mechanism to understand when the connection was performed. So we were thinking about how to solve the problem when creating output plugins. Because if everybody's going to create an output plugin, likely we'll need network I.O. But we don't want to have something like the callback hell, like an OGS, when you have an event loop, you create some connection, and you have to create some callbacks when some event happens on that connection. Okay? Because maybe you can connect to a service, and the moment that you get that report back that you are connected and you're going to write some information, maybe that socket was disconnected or you got, you got some TCP problem. But do you want that every developer from each output plugin handle that? That will be a mess. So we need to abstract that. And also, we need to reduce the blocking time when it's possible. Is there a way to suspend the output plugins and resume? Of course, who's familiar with Golang and similar languages? This is not a new thing. But in C, sometimes it's a bit challenging, but it's something that can be done. So the workflow is like this. When the data was routed to the output plugin, you need to create a TCP connection, convert the internal representation to an output representation, write the data over the network, wait for a response, most of the cases, and return a status. That is the normal workflow of every output plugin. But if you look carefully, there are places that may block my output plugin. But the things that I read right now, they are blocking, but it's not because my program is doing some computer and stuff. It's on the kernel side. So what about if I suspend my execution when I try to do some network operation and just let the kernel notify me back through my event loop and then resume? So this is where introducing coroutines, which are totally hidden for the output plugins. So upon flush time, we create a coroutine for the output plugin. All the network operations are currently abstracted by our own API. So if you want to connect to a service, just use a specific API. 
But that API will handle internally all the errors, all the suspend and resume every time that is required. And that also can be, can be used with TCP or TLS. So if you're running an output plugin and you need TLS, you just use the internal API. Just pass the certificates and that's all. And from a network perspective, you can suspend and you can return the control back every time that you want. So imagine th this is like a very simple uh, sample code coming from the Elasticsearch output plugin. But I want that you focus here. The two things that has the, the red arrows are the sections that my block. So the upstream connections actually say to Fluentbit, please perform a connection to a server, and once you are connected, return me a context that I can use later to flush data over, over that channel. Okay? Here, there are no threads. This is just one main process. But, for example, here in convert format, this part is just blocking because it's competing on that moment. It's, com it's converting the data from one format to the other. For, so here we got the connection. We convert the original data that is coming in message pack to the JSON format that Elastic needs. Then we use the built-in HTTP client using the connection that we get from the step in line, in line eight. And then I do my own request. But as you know, the request also can fail and also can take some time. It depends on the service, but we don't want to block. So basically, what this API does is just flush the whole request, suspend, and continue working. Imagine that it's pretty much like a scheduler in kernel. You, you put some, so IRQ, you have the bottom half, the top half, you have the data flowing in from one space to the other, nothing is blocking, so you just suspend when you don't have anything to do at the moment. And then, here at this point, oops, this is it. I don't want to say exit. Uh, let me check. So we have some return values, but of course we use a specific API to return values because this is our core routines. Otherwise, we're going to mess up with the context of the stack. Okay, so, and also every plugin can return three values. Okay means that I was able to flush my data. I can say, you know what, I was trying to flush my data and I got some problem, please retry. And of course, Fluentbit has in its own retry logic because you don't want to lose data. And if there's something that you cannot deal with, an error means that that data will not be tried to be flushed again. So, and from an internal perspective, we have many uh, helpers in the API for output plugins, like upstream connection, HTTP client, OAuth2, authentication timers, crypto, we support LUAP scripting, I'm going to explain that a little bit, and we have many more. So, just a few plugins that we have implemented in the project, in the input side, we have like tail to, log, to tail log files, we have key message uh, to just try to read kernel messages. Uh, as, you can, as you can see, this was created initially for Embedded Linux, because you want to troubleshoot uh, the message from the kernel, and you want to listen for messages from a serial interface, and we have plugins also for CPU, memory, this, and so on. We can get messages from systemd, from syslog. We can filter the data, which means process the data or filter out some specific information. And we have output plugins to flush the same records to multiple places, Kafka, Stackdriver, Azure, Splunk, and many of them. And sometimes some companies complain about this. You know, for example, in case of Splunk, this plan has their own log forwarder. So, and customers say, hey, why Fluentbit is promoting this? Or, but you have this other option, but Fluentbit offers filtering, which Splunk forwarder doesn't, and so on. So, just have a few minutes before to finish here. So, let me explain a little bit how Fluentbit also plays a role in Kubernetes. Basically, uh, when you have a, a cluster, you have nodes and you have pods. The goal, so the way to deal with logging is that you deploy Fluentbit as a daemon set, which is a pod that runs on every node, and you make Fluentbit pod just read the log files from that node. And of course, you're going to read the, the whole container's information. And then we need to gather the context. 
So Flow Embed or FluentD also can talk to the API server to gather the labels and whole metadata. And then so it can match back the whole information, such as a simple message that started like this, becomes something like with more context. And with this information, with a structure, you can query all the data in a database in a better way. Like, please show me all in the records that are Kubernetes and the pod name is all system go. And also in Kubernetes, we have special features with, where, where we allow the pods to suggest a parser. For example, if you created your own application, and this application has a specific format, which is not JSON or whatever, you can say, you can add your specific annotation and say, please use the parser called Apache. You can configure many, many parsers if you want in a config map. And also, we are discussing how to expand this to support different containers for different streams, but this is an ongoing conversation. We support also a way to get metrics from the log processor using Prometheus or just curl over HTTP. This is a simple, uh, if you want to filter your data and you don't want to create your own plugins in C, you can use the Lua filter and just do a simple function in Lua in a configuration file that can filter the data for you. Well, that was the talk. Thank you.